to understand the sonnets. I will give you an overview of how I approach the sonnets. My interpretation of the sonnets will upset many scholars. No offense meant to most scholars, but people in the know will understand who I mean by the caricature of the crying baby saying, he broke my fear we. I do not believe they were written in the order they appear in the book. Internal evidence suggests that they were written at different times during the poet's life. The task is to fit what is known of his life to events he's referring to as evidence when the poems were written. Here is what Gerald H. Rendell said in Shakespeare's Sonnets and Edward de Vere. The actual life and personality of William Shakespeare are such a blank that every critic can fill in the bare outline or leave them unfilled almost at pleasure. But, on the other hand, the sonnets themselves are so full of indications, hints and data, direct or indirect, that it ought to be possible to give a clear indication of the background and the scenery, the social atmosphere and assumptions, the quality and characteristics of the culture and the per personal relationships which combine to produce them, and thence, if fortune favored, to deduce and even to identify the personality of the writer and the circumstances under which they were produced. This is one reason why Stratfordians have been loath to investigate the sonnets in detail, other than to say that they are thought experiments with no autobiographical detail. I believe what Professor Rendell says here hits close to the mark, if not dead center of the sonnet's content. He writes, do they reflect a wider unity of life, which through successive experiences found an utterance in the poems dictated by the vicissitudes themselves? In other words, do they have autobiographical content? Why do I believe that sonnets need to be interpreted anew? The Stratfordian one doesn't make sense, and the other theories require too many assumptions based on scant evidence. The Stratfordians say, as I said earlier, they are thought experiments. They don't have any autobiographical content, and they are addressed to either the Earl of Southampton or a dark lady. With respect to those theories, I can strip the alleged love triangle from most of the poems. This simplifies what is really a poetic diary of the writer's life. In my previous video, Polyptiton's Glue, I show that many poems are linked by rhetorical figures such as Antiphrasis, Atanoclasis, Polyptiton, Perisologio, and two new ones, Epanodilepsis and Homo Stoicos. I contend that Iliism is used in many poems. Iliism is the rhetorical figure of referring to oneself in the third person. Therefore, the idea that there is a fair youth may be wrong. The poet is the fair youth. Of these 15 sonnets, 14 of them, or 93.33%, can be mapped accurately to events in the Earl of Oxford's life. These 12 sonnets I have already examined, 17 and 18, 33, 40, 66, 116 and 117, 125, 126, 134, 135, and 136. These three, 87, 88, and 89, will be looked at in future videos. 
I will briefly re-examine these two, sonnets 18 and 33, to show authorship references. The following 11 slides summarize what I discussed in this video, Sweet Summer's Child. In sonnet 18, I found the first hint that the sonnets hide clues dating their composition. It's quite simple, really. The poet gives a month at a specific location, the month of May. And the summers, which follows, is at a meaningful location. Summers is the 26th word in the poem. By itself, this doesn't mean anything. But to our poet, it is symbolic of the date when his youngest daughter was born or perhaps baptized. The 26th of May, 1588. Since he is comparing her to a summer's day, we can infer that summers is who he is addressing and that May is when she was born. He probably placed the month on line three to symbolize her age when the poem was composed, which suggests that the poem was composed sometime in 1591. The darling buds of May from line three would therefore be her tiny fingers and toes. I discussed Sonnet 33 in He Was But One Hour Mine. The next 22 slides will review the biographical evidence. In 1575 76, the poet had visited continental Europe and the Alps. This is the subject of the first two lines of the sonnet. Full many a glorious morning have I seen, flatter the mountain tops with sovereign eye, sovereign eye being the sun, and perhaps also his own eye. He would have seen sights such as he described in second section of the quatrain. Kissing with golden face the meadows green, gilding pale streams with heavenly alchemy. But that isn't enough to attribute this poem to him. After all, many nobles and poets traveled through Europe and wrote of their experiences. I believe there are more clues to his authorship in these eight lines, the second and third quatrains. He probably switched to referring to himself in the third person here, using Ilaism at the very first colon in the poem. Since he is the all-powerful poet, he has a sovereign eye. Even though the subject of this poem is so tragic, he compares himself to the sun. Indeed, many people compared him to Apollo. These two lines foreshadow the tragedy that he will describe. He says, Anon permit the basest clouds to ride with ugly rack upon his celestial face. I believe that this is an allusion to his grief and his exile from court. And from the forlorn world his visage hides, stealing unseen to west with this disgrace. The poet had to hide his face from court over a scandal from several years previously. That's why he says, his visage hide. His visage hide in line 7 foreshadows line 12, where he says that the region cloud had masked his son from him. To say the sun has this disgrace is enigmatic. The poet's actual disgrace was to not have a son to inherit his title. 
The colon at the end of this quatrain indicates a change of rhetorical figure back to the first person. He addresses himself in the first person for the remainder of the poem. This line, even so my sun one early morn did shine, has a pun on the word sun, S-O-N, and is an allusion to the burial of his infant son on May 9th, 1583, just a day or two after he was born. He died so suddenly that he was never given a name. One month later, the poet was readmitted to court, which is why I believe these last two lines from the second quatrain refer to his exile. But why did he say he was but one hour mine in line 11? The Stratford man's son lived 11 years. It was hardly like a single hour, which immediately throws him out of contention as the writer of this poem. Some sources say the real poet was a trier of petitions for Wales, Ireland, and England, which meant he had pressing duties in London. The region cloud from line 12 may be a metaphor for a regional court of law, but it also is a good expression of grief. For skeptics, here is an excerpt from Romeo and Juliet that gives clues how the sonnets are to be read. This is from Act 1, Scene 5. It's the only complete sonnet in the play. This is how these lines work. Romeo has the first quatrain. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with this tender kiss. Juliet replies with the second quatrain. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much which mannerly devotion shows in this, for saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. They share the first two lines of the third quatrain like the star-crossed lovers they are. Romeo, have not saints' lips and holy palmers too? Juliet replies, I, pilgrim, Lips that they must use in prayer. Romeo has the last two lines of the final quatrain. O oh, then, dear saint, let lips that do what hands do, they pray, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Juliet then begins the final couplet. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Romeo ends the final couplet and the sonnet. Then move not while my prayer's effect take. The clues in this excerpt is that the sonnets in the quattro should be read as if they were dialogues in a play. Just as two characters are reciting this sonnet, in the collection, individual poems can address more than one person. Just as two characters are reciting the sonnet, in the collection, sets of poems can address individuals or different people. Just as two characters are reciting the sonnet in a scene from a play, Poems address specific or general scenes in the poet's life. They are autobiographical. Imagine the poems surrounding the poet like the planets surround the sun. They are scenes from his life orbiting him, his memories recalling now one person or event, then another.
Remember that the evidence from these sonnets is cumulative and has to be seen in context. The more evidence we get from the poems, the stronger it is that the context is right. Of these 15 sonnets, 14 of them, or 93.33%, can be mapped accurately to events in the Earl of Oxford's life story. Were it not for the number puzzle in Sonnet 40, the poem could be about any poet. Given the preponderance of evidence from just these two sonnets, number 18 and 33 alone, we can see that the poems form his poetical diary. The editors of this 2020 collection, All the Sonnets of Shakespeare, Sir Stanley Wells and Dr. Paul Edmondson, were sadly mistaken. The sonnets are deeply personal and many have to be read in the order in which they appear in the 1609 quarto. Regardless who you think wrote the sonnets, the signs are clear. It was Edward de Vere. This is more evidence that Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, was Shakespeare. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.